Welcome to Shaname, Book of Kings. Today we begin a new chapter called The Occultation of K. Kosrov. Once Kavas felt that his land was safe, he opened his heart to God and said, O thou who art the guide to every blessing, and who art higher than all fate, through you I found far glory, good fortune, greatness, my crown and my throne. You have given no one else the treasure and fame that you gave to me. I asked you for a warrior who would avenge the blood of Siavash, and I saw my far-sighted grandson, ambitious, glorious, and wise, a man who outshines all former kings. But now I have lived for a hundred and fifty years, and my hair that was black as musk has turned as white as camphor. My body that was as straight and elegant as a cypress is bent like a bow. And if my days are to come to an end, I shall not see death as a misfortune." A short while later he died. All that remained of him in the world was his name. The Lord Kosrov came from his palace and sat down on the black earth, dressed in black and dark blue, devoid of all glory. The Persian nobles walked before him on foot. They mourned their king for two weeks and built him a palatial tomb, ten lariats lengths high. His body was treated with a salve compounded of camphor and musk, and then wrapped in robes of silk and brocade. Attendants placed him on an ivory dais, and anointed his head with camphor and musk. K. Kosrov left the chamber, and the door to the king's resting place was sealed. No one ever saw Kavas again. He rested from war and revenge forever. Such is the passing world that you must leave. All men must die, and it is vain to grieve. No learning will suffice against death's hand, whose might no arms or helmet can withstand. And king or prophet, in the end, you must descend to dirt and slumber in the dust. Pursue desire. Consider life a game, and if you can, look out for luck and fame. But know the world's your enemy. Your head will lie in dust, and the grave will be your bed. The king mourned his grandfather for forty days, shunning the crown and the throne and pleasures. Then he set himself on the ivory throne and placed on his head the heart-delighting crown. The army assembled, and the nobility came round about him in their golden diadems, and they acclaimed him as king and scattered jewels over his crown. The victorious champion was enthroned, and from end to end the world rejoiced. Sixty years passed, and all the world was under the king's command. The king's great skull began to brood on his power and on the passing of time. He said, I have cleansed all inhabited lands of malevolent souls, from India to China to Byzantium, from east to west, mountains and wastelands and deserts and fertile plains, they are all under my command. The world has no fear now of evil things, and I have lived for many days. Although it was revenge I sought, God granted me all that I wished. My soul must not become filled with hubris, with foul thoughts in the ways of Ariman. I shall then be as evil as Zahok, or like Jamshid, who suffered the same fate as Tor and Son. On the other side, I have descended from Kavas, and on the other from the wicked wizard Tor. My ancestors are Kavas and Afrazab, who even when he slept, dreamt only of crookedness and trickery. One day I shall become ungrateful to God. Terror will touch my soul's radiance. The divine fire will leave me, and I shall swerve toward crookedness and evil. I shall go forward into darkness, until my head and crown are tumbled in the dust. I shall leave an evil name behind me, and my fate before God will be evil. My flesh will decay, and my bones will lie scattered on the ground. Virtue will fail, ingratitude will take its place, and in the other world my soul will dwell in darkness." when another has taken my crown and throne and trampled on my fortune, and my name will be known for evil. If that rose that grew from old age struggles will be a briar no more. Now that I have sought vengeance, 
adorned the world with splendor, killed those who rose against God and whom it was necessary to kill. There is not a place on earth which does not recognize my authority. However wealthy or strong they may be, the great of the earth are my servants. I am grateful to God that he has given me this far, and that the heaven's revolutions have looked favorably on me. It is best that I turn now toward God, that I seek him while I can still do so honorably. As one who has prayed to him privately, it will take my soul to the abode of the blessed, for this crown and throne will perish. No one will ever have more fame or happiness or greatness or peace of mind than I have enjoyed. I have reached life's bourne. I have seen the world's secrets. It's good and evil. What is plain? What is hidden? And I have seen that whether a man tills the soil or reigns as a king, he must finally pass through death. The king ordered his chamberlain to send away anyone who might come seeking him, and to do this politely, with sweet words avoiding all harshness. He shut the doors to his court, loosened his clothes, and began to lament his state. He washed his head and body preparatory to praying with the torch of wisdom. He sought out a path toward God. Then he strode to the place where he prayed and spoke to the judge of all secrets. O oh, higher than all souls of unmatched worth, who makes fire spurt forth from the darkened earth, look on me now. Vouchsafe me wisdom here to know the truth, to know what I should fear. I'll pray to you incessantly and strive to do good deeds whilst I remain alive. Absolve me of the evil I have done. Let me not trespass against anyone. Drive sin out from my soul and keep me free from demons and their cunning sorcery. Let me control desire that one control over Zahok, Kavas, Jamid's soul. If devils hide the road to what is right, evil will triumph when I come to fight. Save me from demon wiles. Let me avoid the snares by which my soul will be destroyed. Lead me. Protect me. Be my constant guide to where the just eternally abide. Day and night he stood in prayer. His body was in the palace, but his soul was in another place. After a week, his strength began to fail. He found he could stand no longer, and on the eighth day, he returned to his throne. The champions of the Persian army were bewildered by their king's behavior, each of them ascribing to a different cause. The king took his place on the throne, and the chamberlain drew back the curtains that separated him from his courtiers. The commanders entered, their arms crossed in humility over their chests. Among them were Tus, Gudas, Jiv, Gorjan, Bizen, and the lion-hearted Roham. When they saw the king, they prostrated themselves before him and said, O brave and just king, possessor of the world, noblest of the noble, no king has ever assumed the throne. All champions serve you, and we live only because you watch and keep over us. You have laid all our enemies low, and there is no one in the world for you to fear. We have no notion why the king's thoughts should be darkened at a time like this. Now is the time for you to rejoice in your good fortune, not to grieve your life away in anxiety. Whether we have done something to upset the king, or whether it is another matter that is no fault of ours, may he tell us what his troubles are, so that we can reassure him and bring fire back to his cheeks. And if some secret enemy disturbs his peace, may the king inform us who it is. Each king who has worn the crown has seen the value of his wealth and might in this, and that he could cut off his enemy's heads or sacrifice his own head when he put on the warrior's helmet and rode out to war. Tell us what you are hiding, and we will find a remedy for it. The great king answered, Set your minds at rest, my champions. The world contains no enemy that troubles me, and my wealth is all intact. Nothing the army has done has offended me, and none of you is guilty of a sin. When I rode out in vengeance for my father's death, I spread justice and righteousness throughout the world. There is no portion of the black earth that has not known my soul's imprint. Sheath your swords and grasp the wine cup. 
drink, rejoice, replace the noise of bowstrings with the sounds of flutes and harps. For a week now, I have prayed before God. I have a hidden desire which I long for God to grant me. When he answers my prayer, this will be a blessing for me, and I shall tell you openly what it is. Meanwhile, you too should pray to God on my behalf, for it is he who gives us strength for good and evil. Pray to him for guidance. Then give yourself to wine and cheerfulness. Forget all of sorrow. Know that this unstable world makes no distinction between a king and his subjects, that it snatches away both the old and the young, and from that both justice and tyranny come to us. Sadly and anxiously, the nobles left his presence, and the king ordered his chamberlain to admit no one to him. That night he returned to the palace of prayer, and opened his lips to the Lord of Justice. O oh, higher than the highest, show to me the ways of righteousness and purity. Guide me to heaven, let me leave behind this fleeting habitation of mankind, and let my heart show and shun sin, so that I might pass to the realm of everlasting light. After a week had passed, and Kostro had still not reappeared, a confused murmuring could be heard. The nobles gathered together, and there was much discussion of the ways of great kings, both of those who were God-fearing and those who had passed and lived as tyrants. Finally, Gudas and Jib's father turned to his son and said, Fortune has favored you, and you've always given your support to the crown and the throne. You've undergone many troubles for Iran's sake, putting your loyalty before your family and homeland. Now a crisis is before us, and should not be taken lightly. You must travel to Zabol and tell Zal and Rostam that the king has turned away from God and has lost his way. He has barred his court doors to the nobility and takes counsel with demons. We have tried to reason with him, and our words were meant well, but though the, he heard us out, he gave no answer. We can see that his heart is confused, and his head is full of wind. We're afraid that he'll go astray, as Kavas did, and that demons will lead him into evil paths. Tell Rostam and Zal that they are heroes, that they are the wisest and most capable of men. Have them assemble the astrologers and sages of Sabol, and bring them here to Iran. Since Kostrov has hidden his face from us, the kingdom is full of rumors. We have tried every remedy, and now all our hopes rest on Zal and his son. Jiv chose a number of warriors at his retinue and set off for Sistan. There he told Rostam and Zal what he had seen and heard. Zal was saddened by his words and said, Truly, grief has become our companion. And then he ordered Rostam to call together the astrologers and priests of Sistan and Kabul so that they could accompany them on his journey to Iran. Sages of all kinds gathered at Zal's court, and group set out. The king prayed for seven days, and on the eighth, at daybreak, he returned to his throne and had the chamberlains draw back the curtain from the outer door. The chieftains and priests streamed into the audience hall, and Kostrov received them graciously as befits a king, motioning them to their places. But they stood before him, their hands crossed in reverence over their chest, and none sat in the place where he had been assigned. They said, Immortal soul, just lord of all the world, might and the royal far belong to you, and from sun to the fish beneath the earth is yours. Your clear soul knows all beings. Speak wisely to us. We stand before you as your slaves and champions. Tell us what we have done that you forbid us access to you. Days have passed like this, and our hearts are filled with foreboding. Tell your secret to us, the guardians of your distant frontiers. If your sorrow is from the sea, we shall dry it up and spread it with a mantle of powdered musk. If it is from the mountain, we shall level it with our daggers. Spit your enemies' hearts. If wealth will cure your sorrow, there will be no lack of cash. We are all guardians of your glory, and we weep in sympathy for your sorrows. The world's lord answered, 
I am not without need of my champions. But my heart has no anxiety about my might or men or wealth, and no country produced an enemy for me to worry about. My heart has conceived a desire which I'll not relinquish. In the dark night and the bright days I have hopes it will be fulfilled. When I achieve it, I will tell you what my secret prayers have been. Go now, victorious and happy, and rid your minds of evil thoughts. All his nobility paid him homage but their minds were clouded with sorrow. When they had left, the king ordered that the curtains be lowered, and he who had won so many victories sat weeping by the door with despair in his heart. Again, the world's lord stood in prayer, asking for guidance. Lord of heavens, Lord of unmatched might, of goodness, justice, and celestial light, what shall my kingdom profit me if you remain unsatisfied with all I do? But good or evil may my deeds suffice to win for me a place in paradise. He prayed before God, wailing and groaning in his anguish, and after five weeks of prayer, one night as the moon rose, he fell asleep. He slept, but his bright soul became wisdom's companion and did not sleep. In his dream, he saw the angel Sorish whisper in his ear, O king, good fortune and benevolent stars have guided you, and you have seen enough of torques and crowns and thrones. If you would leave this world, you have found what you are seeking. You will find a home beside the source of righteousness. There is no need for you to sojourn in this darkness any longer. Give your treasures to those who are deserving. Relinquish this fleeting world to another. When you enrich the poor and your own people, you will be made stronger. You will not remain here long now. Choose a king in whom all creatures, down to the smallest ant, can put their trust. And when you've given away the world, you cannot rest. You must prepare for your departure. When the exhausted king woke, he saw that the place where he had been praying was awash with water. He wept and placed his face against the ground, giving thanks to God. He said, If I can soon move onward, God will have given me all I desire. He dressed himself in clothes that had never been worn before, and ascended his throne. There he sat, but wearing neither his torque, nor the royal jewels, nor his crown. At the week's end, Rostam and Zal arrived in Iran, full of apprehension as to what was afoot. Hearing of their approach, a group of heavy-hearted Iranian nobles, led by Tus and Gudaz, hurried out to greet them. They said, The devil Iblis has led our king astray. What is his court but his army? And yet for days and nights now no one has seen him, except during the brief more months, when the court doors are opened to us. My lords, Kostrov has changed from that cheerful and glorious monarch we knew. His cypress stature is bent, and the roses of his cheeks have turned pale as a quince. I don't know what evil eye has struck him, and why he withers like a shriveled petal, unless it is that the Persian's luck is clouded, and misfortune strikes him from an evil star. Brave Zal said to them, It may be that the king is sated with power, and all seems well, and then difficulties arise. Pleasure and pain both come to us. Do not grieve over this. Grief will only weaken your grip on life. We shall talk with him. Our advice will make the stars favorable again. The group traveled to the court, where immediately the curtain was drawn back, and they entered in good spirits. Zal, Rostam, Tas, Gudas, Gorgin, Bizen, Gastaholm, and a great many other nobles and their retainers crowded into the audience chamber. When Kostrov heard Rostam's voice from beyond the curtain, and Zal saw Zal's face, he was puzzled, and he leapt up from the throne. He extended his hand to them and asked them why they had come. Then he questioned the sages of Zabol and its inverns, and motioned them to seat in his court. The Iranian nobles, too, were assigned places according to their rank. Zal greeted the king and wished him long life, listing the great monarchs of the past and saying that he had seen none who equaled Kosrov in stature and possessions of the divine far. 
and chivalry, victory, and benevolence. He hoped that the king would reign forever, continuing to bestow justice on the world and enjoying the fruits of conquest, for there was no noble who was not as dirt beneath the king's feet, no poison for which the king's mere name was not a remedy. Then he continued, We have heard unwelcome news. In hearing it, we hurried to your court. We have consulted astrologers with their Indian charts, seeking to know heaven's secrets and why it has exiled Iran from its benevolence. A messenger came saying that the victorious king has ordered that the curtains and the guards his court not be drawn back, and that the king hides his face from his people. Sympathy for the Persians has made me fly here like an eagle, like a skiff over water, so that I might ask the world's lord what secret anxiety is troubling him. Three things cure all ills and make the throne wholly secure. These three are wealth, effort, and the chivalrous men without these battles can be fought. And the fourth is that we praise God, praying before him day and night for it, as it is he who helps his slaves and saves them from harm. We shall give great wealth to the poor in hopes that God will clarify your soul and that wisdom will course through your brain again. When Kostrov had heard Zal, out he came with him a wise answer. He said, Old man, your words and thoughts are always welcome from the time of Manachar until now. You have advised the court well. And your mammoth-bodied son, Rostam, has been a prop to the Kyanid kings and censors of the court. It was he who brought out Siavash and taught him virtue. When an army caught sight of his massive mace, his helmet and mighty stature, many would flee without fighting, abandoning their bows and arrows on the battlefield. He guided my ancestors in their wars of vengeance. If I list all your exploits, I will be ta talking for, I don't know, a hundred generations. And if my words seem flattery, they will, if examined truly, be seen to underestimate you. But as to your question about why I have not granted audience, the world has become contemptible to me, and for five weeks now I have stood in prayer before God, the just guide, asking that he absolve me of past sins and illuminate the darkened moon of my life, asking that he take me from this fleeting world and that I suffer here no longer. I have been close to abandoning the ways of righteousness, to twisting my head aside as other kings before me have done. Now that I have achieved all I sought, I must prepare to leave this world. And good news has reached me. Last night, at dawn, I slept, and an angel came to me from God, saying, Rise, the time for your departure has come. Your sleepless sorrow is over. My reign and all my concern for the army, crown, and throne are drawing to an end. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more. Until then, my friends. <laughs>